Faraday, welcome to another episode of Hearthstone Deck Tech, where we talk about different archetypes in the game and catch uh, get some interviews with some notable players and casters uh, in the Hearthstone scene. I just came back from my vacation in Japan. I know we missed last week's episode, but we have a special guest today. So, and this is the first time we've had a guest of this type. We've never had a caster, a Hearthstone professional Hearthstone caster. And we have one today who also happens to be a re really good Hearthstone player, has hit number rank one legend just this past week as well. So uh, Gia, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. So Gia, um, you are a professional Hearthstone caster, a very good Hearthstone player. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you got started in the game? Right, so I was actually one of those grassroots people that started by attending fireside gatherings. Um, there used to be a board game cafe near my university that I would go to every Sunday because they would hold these little tournaments, about 12 to 20 people every week. And it was just our little group, but we would be really consistent about it. And I got a taste of competition through there. And then at one point, the owner of the board game cafe wanted to have a bigger tournament that would be streamed and he asked if i wanted to cast it and i said sure why not and through that event i met people that worked at mineski and esl southeast asia at the time and worked a couple more local events and then they recommended me to uh, blizzard southeast asia because at the time they were lacking local english speaking talent mm -hmm. and so um like through i call it rng basically but right being at the right place at the right time and them enjoying my work, I got to do the Hearthstone Malaysia major in December 2016. And ever since then, I've just been doing uh, more and more events in Asia Pacific and eventually got to work uh, the playoffs and then two weeks of GM. Awesome. Amazing. So be, when you started doing all this casting stuff, were you already like, um, I mean, a very good Hearthstone player? I mean, had you hit Legend already? Were you already in the top 100 uh -huh. at that point? Yeah, I was definitely the first time I hit Legend was like 2015. Um, I don't know when I first got like top 100 or so, but I'm pretty sure I had hit it by that point. Like I was decent at the game, like um, nowhere near my level right now, but I think that I was definitely at a good enough level to cast. And that's a big part of why I kept getting hired back, I think, is because people liked my analysis. Did you... Um... Are there, you know, I'm not familiar with the casting scene in the Philippines. Like, are there any other notable casters um, that people should look out for or maybe listen to that are from the Philippines? That, or are you just the so, most notable? Um, Like, not to flex, but I do think I'm the most notable Hearthstone caster, at least uh, English speaking for the Philippines, mm -hmm. because we don't really have a lot of talent that goes abroad mm -hmm. to work the more visible events. But we have, like, a healthy like local competitive scene where they're always fielding new people. And um, I have a friend, Riku. She does way other, way many other games than Hearthstone, but she did Hearthstone at the, uh, was it WESG Southeast Asia qualifiers uh -huh. or, or finals last, uh, last year. And she's been doing a little bit of Hearthstone overseas too. So she's one to watch out for. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. You know, honestly, I really like that. Like your commentary is not like this. OK, but typical Filipino commentary can get so bodacious. <laughs> I love yes. it. I love it. OK, it depends on the game, though. Like Dota. OK, like, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. So Dota, like you can there's a voice chat wheel. Right. And then like you can upgrade yes. your account. You get the chat wheel. You can get like the the Russian chat wheel or the Chinese chat wheel. The best chat wheel is by far. The Philippine, the Tagalog chat wheel. It's just like so hilarious. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, it's so great. Normaline. What does normaline mean? Do you know what normaline uh, means? I, I don't even play Dota, but then I guess like when you add in to the end of uh -huh. a verb, right? You have to make it normal. So in the normaline, I, I don't know. Oh my god. I, I, I look. I speak Filipino, but I don't yeah. speak Dota. That's a problem. There you go. There and you then, go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I know it's a big meme in the community. I, it's so ridiculous. I, I love it. I love it. I think it's the greatest thing. Yeah. Even my local scene here, like for other games, uh, the, the, the people with the, 
of Filipino descent. They always have the best commentary. It's just like like an inside joke between them, like a brotherhood, like you know. And I, I love mm-hmm. it. It's just it's so hype. But um, anyway. Yeah. Um, I think it works really well for Dota, but I don't know how to quite translate that to Hearthstone <laughs> because there's not much you can really shout at in Hearthstone. And then it's like they're super entertaining and I yeah. really respect that type of work, but I just don't think it would be quite apt for Hearthstone. Definitely not. Hearthstone, the action is a, a lot slower. But that said, your commentary is always very insightful and like you put a lot of forethought um, and like... Really, you are a great player. I 100%. You are like really an amazing Hearthstone player. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate that. No, that is truth. That That is fact, guys. If you don't follow Gia, follow her on Twitter. It's uh, at Gia D <laughs> underscore, right? There's an underscore there. Um, mm-hmm. Gia underscore D was taken. Unlucky. Yeah, who, who did that? I wonder who that person is, but that is... Like, you're, you're honestly just an incredible her, uh, Hearthstone player. And I was looking at your Wikipedia just to see, like, you know, your earnings in the game over the past, like, year. And, I mean, man, you're, like, 33,000 U.S. dollars. Like, well, that was from one organizer. W-E-S-O-E hey. was, like, a really lucky break for me. But, I mean, I'll take it. Right? You know, I even watched, like, a, some teaser video where, like, the guy is making the necklace. He's like building the necklace yeah. and all the. Oh and I was God. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. "Holy cow! This is awesome! That that is like, man, that is esports right there. That is awesome." Yeah, that that company they're really up and coming. Um, I think they're now going under esport esports esports or something like that. Estar Studios. They mm-hmm. produce a tournament series called WSOE. Um, it's been going on for six events already. The seventh one is coming up this month, and they do all sorts of different games. But they did Hearthstone twice and. The Hearthstone one was an all-female invitational, so I ended up winning the first one, which gave me a huge advantage in the second one, because I only had to play one set. Wow. <laughs> and because they have this whole title defense type uh, thing, which was yeah, kind of yeah. weird, honestly, from a Hearthstone perspective, but their whole branding is about hype and treating this as, like, top-level competition, which it is when you brand it that way. It sure is. And, um, yeah, so I... I owe them a lot, honestly, because w- without that kind of opportunity, I don't think I would have been able to establish myself as a player so much. Mm. And that's nothing wrong with that. Like, I'm fine being labeled as a caster, but I, I really like that people get to see both sides of my work. Definitely. Before we get into more of the issues and details about casting, um, maybe you can talk a little bit about your most recent uh, experience as a player, I guess, at a competitive level. I know you did, uh, you, you made the qualifier for the GM, right? Like through uh, uh, Vegas? Not GM, through, for a Masters Tour, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you did the Vegas, you made top four there, right? And then... Mm, I did, oh, oh, the qualifier, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's two types of qualifiers, right, for the Masters Tour. Um, there's one that is winning an Open. They changed it to top two, but at the time it was either yeah. you win an Open or you finish top 200 and ladder and then you play a tournament for those 200 people and then the top four of the ladder tournament get to qualify so i did the ladder tournament and i top four that one so that's how i got to go to vegas as a competitor and that was also um specialist format right it was yes do you like specialist as a format next question no I'm <laughs> <laughs> um oh, yeah, no, was- i, I Okay, so it's not as bad as I thought it would be when I first heard about it because mm-hmm. I thought, oh my god, we're only going to see the yeah. same deck every single week, right? Because sure. why would you bring anything but the strongest deck? But then uh, after talking with players and doing my own prep about how to build lineups, there's actually quite a deep level of thinking that goes into it. But from a viewer perspective, I think it's just not that great because even though it's not just three decks maybe you see a couple um of other like like uh paladin coming out yeah archetypes Mm -hmm. um like the holy wrath paladin pogo rogue it's very niche right so for the most part you're going to be seeing the same decks and i feel like what makes hearthstone very entertaining is that you play multiple classes Mm -hmm. and like i just want to see that more as a viewer and as a caster i feel like there's way more to talk about when you do lineup building based on different decks instead of just Mm, two or three tech cards yeah no i I totally agree um on that note what do you think about the grandmasters yeah i I don't want to ask you too many um questions like this because i know you're a caster and i want you 
to be able to give an unbiased answer. But, um, you know, what, what do you think about the Grandmaster setup anyway? Like how it's limited to these 48 players and the criteria. Um, I mean, you know, it's kind of right. weird just because, like, so, they were picked before the criteria was ever released. So that one's kind of, it's just tricky, right? You know, but. Yeah, this is a whole can of worms to open up. But um, as concisely as possible, I can say that the idea of GM, I think, is a positive thing for Hearthstone. Because last year we had this saturation of tournaments where, uh, for a, from a viewer perspective, you're seeing new names every week or so. And you're like, who do I follow? Who do I root for? It's just too many. Right. Um, with GM, you can prop up the biggest personalities of Hearthstone and really create um, a brand for them and have these ambassadors for the game, which I think is a positive thing. But I, what I don't like is that it is basically GM and then three Masters Tours. That's the only way you get visibility as somebody that isn't GM. So I feel like if GM were done at a time when um, either playing at more tour stops was more viable or if you could actually make it to GM this year uh, without being mm -hmm. invited prior, that would be much better. So like, I just wish that GM was not a replacement for HTT, but rather it was something done um, on top of HTT. Let's talk a little bit about um, casting. Like, mm -hmm. I've never casted something of that scale. Like, how challenging? What are the biggest challenges with casting? Like, do you, what do you think are the biggest? Um, challenges? the biggest challenge. So, the for me, my biggest challenge is being entertaining because I think about the game a lot and I have a lot of insight. Every single play I look at, I think of many things I want to analyze, and I'm I think I'm pretty good at. Um, uh, communicating that type of thought process, but I struggle with being hype at the right time, with emphasizing when something really important is happening. And that's why I really admire people like Admirable, haha, <laughs> no pun intended, um, who are able to inject way more of the excitement into the game. And then there's TJ who has like this humor and this ability to gel with anybody he's talking to. Mm -hmm. Personally, I have a more difficult time uh, with the banter part of casting and kind of just joking around with my partner and make it seem like we're just having a conversation yeah. as two friends, right? I feel like I'm a little bit too formal. That's my biggest challenge. But I understand that for many other people, there's many other different things to worry about. Like some people are just not confident with talking for long periods of time. It's very tiring. Mm -hmm. There are some people that cannot put their complex thoughts into words more easily. And then there are people that have a hard time wording themselves diplomatically, which is also a difficult thing for casting. And there's a whole lot of other things. So uh, typically when you do these tournaments, do does Blizzard or whoever the organizer, organizer of these tournaments, do they break you down into one of you guys is like the color commentary and one of you guys is more of the play-by-play, uh, -play, like a detail uh, commentator? Right. When um, I would say that for GM, it's definitely been paired up that way consciously. But as of the tour stops last year, sometimes it's hard to get talent at all to fly out to mm -hmm. this place halfway across the globe on such short notice. So that wasn't always in place. But I do think they're doing that more consciously now, where you have one analyst and one host. And I'm almost always in the analyst role but i've tried some hosting which mm -hmm. i think i'm decent but nowhere near as good as i am as an analyst so um you know i know like either there are always two criticisms that i always see like on social media when it comes to um these larger scale esports events um and the mm -hmm. play and it's usually that players misplay a lot especially in the mm -hmm. in the gm like there there have been a bunch of people who misplayed you right know, which is going to happen, right? That's how people win or lose. For sure. And yeah. that casters either are too critical. I, either casters don't see the best lineup play or mm -hmm. that they criticize a lineup play that doesn't look like the best lineup play, but maybe is the best lineup play. And I know that this is a point of contention because it's happened a lot, right? I mean, um, mm -hmm. what do you think about... Yeah. Uh yeah. Like, what, what, um, oh, sorry, I on, actually go. tweeted a long set of notes on this, actually, mm -hmm. because I've been on both ends of that. But the funny thing to note, I think Sotl tweeted about this, is that 
earlier on in Hearthstone, casters were criticized for being too soft on the players. Like we wouldn't take hardline stances, we wouldn't call out misplays directly. Uh, but nowadays, uh, the GMs are, I guess, I wouldn't say sensitive, but more conscious of how they're represented. Because, I mean, it's my belief that reputation does matter because that's how you get selected for GM in the first place is you have a, a following, you're respected by the community and Blizzard thinks you're a good rep for them. So if you are misrepresented as looking like um, you made a bad play, even though you made the best play, it's fair to be upset by it. Um, sure. Especially if you're somebody that is not that well established because mm -hmm. there are some GM players that are newer to the viewers than others who to certain viewers can do no wrong. Um, so yeah. I think that's a thing that casters and players should be conscious about. But the way that people have been calling each other out on Twitter sometimes just seems like way too much for me. Like the players, when they got salty, I'm not, I'm not going to name names, but there were some tweets that just seemed like they were assuming the caster was actually trying to make them look bad, which is never what we tried to do. Never. Yeah. It's just an honest mistake on the caster's part. And I feel like it should be common knowledge to every viewer and every player and every caster that what the caster is saying is not the word of God. We're never 100% correct. We are also just trying to give our own opinions on the play. And that is subject to our own knowledge, which won't be perfect. And it obviously won't be on the same level as the GMs. But yeah. the thing is, sometimes the viewers are a little bit too results oriented or they hold a caster's word as being true it's just like it's really weird right because some like the most popular meme for casters is sap casters right we suck at the game blah blah mm. blah but then sometimes when we call out a play with caster vision they're like yeah of course you make that play why is the player you know um not doing the obviously correct thing and then it makes them bad right so it, it's really difficult to cast um with uh while being impartial, I would say. Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's certainly a thing. And I think, I mean, you know, I don't want to put anyone on the spot or anything, but, like, uh, I know that it's difficult to be a female and be involved in the Hearthstone scene, especially at that level. How many female players are in the Grandmasters right now? Is there only one? One. It's Patra. Patra. That's it? <laughs> that's it. So, like, you know, even her situation, like, because she's under such a microscope, she's the only female mm -hmm. player, like, t Twitch viewers are ready to call her out on every single play, whether it's the right player or the wrong play. And um, yeah. I think that makes your job way harder, like, simply because, I, you know, like you said, you got, you got to make a decision on the spot on whether or not you thought that play was correct or if there was a better right. line of play. And I think mm -hmm. the semantics wording can get you in trouble mm -hmm. or, or not, you know? And I, I think it was a difficult job, definitely. It's a yeah. tough job. Well, so. as a caster, I try to just, um, like, regardless of a player's identity, I just try to give my honest opinion every time. Um, with Patra's case, obviously, she has gotten way more criticism than other players, mm -hmm. despite her result being just one more loss than the next worst performing player in GM. Yes. And I think that's really unfair. But I am not going to sugarcoat any type of opinion I have on any player as a caster. I feel like that's that's my duty. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not actively thinking about, should I be like less critical of this player's place? Like It would be the same if we had, say, a representative that was transgender or a representative that was uh, physically um, handicapped of some sort. Like, For sure. It, it, it's like I they're just playing in that moment. So if I think it's correct, I'm going to say so. If I think they got unlucky or they did something incorrect, I'm going to say so as well. Um, with Patra, though, uh, it's the same. But I also have this um, personal relationship with her. I talk to her a lot about it because I'm the only woman that's cast GM so far. And she's the only woman that's been playing GM. And she's gotten so much harsh criticism. And I try to be there for her. Of course. Um, at the same time, when I'm on the desk, though, I'm not going to be biased at all. And um, if we're going to open up this conversation about what it's like to be a woman in Hearthstone, and I think that's a whole other separate thing from, uh, is it difficult to um, like choose your words carefully? Yeah, I 
I totally agree. I mean, and I don't, we can get into that discussion. Um, I don't, mm -hmm. like, we don't have to. I, I don't really want to turn yeah. turn it into that type of discussion simply because I, I, I feel like, you know, maybe it's not the right platform to get that type of exposure. Um, well, but I we don't can. mind that. I treat this as an AMA. <laughs> like, if so, get so, so let's talk about how difficult sure. is it sure. to be a female and play okay. uh, her, competitive Hearthstone mm -hmm. or cast? So I can talk about my experience. I understand it's probably much different for other women in the scene. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's been both positives and negatives, but I actually think that the positives have outweighed the negatives for me, which is not something that most women can say. I've been really lucky, honestly. Um, I think that I often think about when I got my first gig casting, did somebody um, look at my application. I didn't really apply on paper, but did they look at me as a potential caster as someone with value added because I have representation of a minority? Mm -hmm. I will never know, but I genuinely believe that after my first few opportunities, I kept getting hired back purely because I am talented at casting. Oh, that's 100% um, the truth. 100%. Mm -hmm. so. um, and then when we talk about uh, what are the other benefits, like Obviously, I wouldn't have gotten invited to WSOE if I was not a woman. I wouldn't have made that amount of money. And more importantly, I wouldn't have gotten the opportunity to establish myself as a competitor if I was not a woman. So, I mean, I would say that's a huge positive as well. Um, the negatives that I've experienced, I feel like every woman has experienced, which is just like um, whenever you go on stream, there will always be a handful or more people on Twitch chat that will assume you're only there because you're a woman. Mm -hmm. They're going to assume you're clueless about the game or you're there just to fill a quota. That's always annoying. But in terms of just like, you know, having toxic viewers say things about you that, I mean, you could make the argument that, yeah, Twitch chat does that to everyone. I don't think that's a good argument to say why we should tolerate it. But I don't think I've gotten the same amount of verbal abuse as many other women in the scene. And I'm like not really qualified to talk about the most difficult aspects of it, I think, because, yeah, but I will say that it seems like when you're a woman, people really care more about what you look like than it would compared to when they're watching a guy play. That's just the truth. Yeah, I, I think so. I think so. Um, you know, like when I think about, uh, so one of my questions that I wanted to ask you was like, what players are you surprised? Did you think should have made season one of the GM and that you're surprised not to see? And I, I want to mm. ask you that question, but I also want to ask you if you thought there was a female player that should have been, um, on the representative. That's a, it's GM. a it's a really tough question. I don't think we can get into this without discussing what GM is meant to be in the first place, because my big problem with it is that the way it's touted is that it's the 48 best players in the world, top players, purely merit based, blah, blah, blah. Right. But then when they go into the criteria, mm -hmm. they talk about how some of the slots are given for a community contribution. Yeah. So those two are already at a disparity, right? So I think that what people need to understand is that like the top 48 best players is just like Blizzard is going to label it that way. But ultimately, it's the people who they think will represent their game the best. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so if we're talking about being in there based on merit, I was really surprised to not see Language Hacker there, to not see Ike, to not see A8 um, numbers. The, the European player, basically everybody at Worlds mm -hmm. who didn't make it, that to me was a big shocker. I was also shocked that Oskaka and Sixo were yeah. not invited, or, or rather Oskaka was invited, I think, but that's um, uh, another story. Um, in terms of, if I think about it, aside from the merit-based thing, and if I think about it, did they have an opportunity to have better representation for their game, then I could have stood to see more female players. I also could have stood to see more transgender players, to see people of different races aside from, like, well, I don't think we've seen a single African-American player at um, GM. If, that's if they want to look at it as 
you know, trying to be as diverse as possible. They mm-hmm. could have included players with physical disabilities and things like that. Um, so it's a really difficult a- uh, question to answer if you're thinking about, if you're thinking of GM as like, what is the best way to represent the Hearthstone fan base? Because that is something I can't do by myself. Mm-hmm. Blizzard has data on their viewers. They have um, analytics on the type of people that actually play Hearthstone. And maybe they decided one one woman out of 48 is accurate representation. I would not know. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I'll just say that based on merit, I would as really surprised not to see the world's players there. Yeah, for sure. So I, you know, yeah, we touch upon some of the GM, some of those spots are reserved for like, um, I don't, I don't even know what you would uh, classify them, but as content creators that are like Strife Crow, right? Like he didn't get in through his. I think he was in through the prize money earnings, oh, not was through he? the community contribution. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. the community so con- NA, contributors. The- right. I'm sorry. Yeah, those are the legend spots. So yeah. for for Americas, that was Delay and Nalgidan, if I'm not mistaken. So you, there's not any contribu- uh, community contributor that you are. I mean, I get not surprised, but kind of just uh, wish we're hopeful that um, maybe made it in. Uh, well, I think that in terms of selecting community contributors, uh, contributors that have also had competitive achievements. I mm-hmm. think that they did a, like all six of them are qualified based yeah. on that because they could have selected someone like Crip, for example, who hasn't competed in years, but obviously he's one of the biggest content creators. Yeah. Um, someone like Toast, um, but they did not do that. So I feel like that's still a nod to not being completely sell out. No offense to Crip or Toast, right? But mm-hmm. this is still meant to be like, to some degree, the top players of Hearthstone. So I think that their choices of community contributors were pretty decent. I do wish that there were more slots though, because there are other community contributors that (coughs) also would meet those criteria. Oh yeah, I-48 doesn't even begin to touch the surface of like the amount of good, not just players, but even content creators that are out there in the game and contributors to the Hearthstone uh, community. Um, Absolutely. Let's move on a little bit. I, this is that got, that conversation is getting too like, you know, too serious. <laughs> I want to talk more about Hearthstone. So okay, um, all right. You know, uh, I know you hit Legend first in like 2015. Um, mm-hmm. Did you think there was a huge barrier between hitting it, like when you first hit it, like uh, were you at a wall? Did something click in your head, or were you just naturally, you know? I had a lot of self-made barriers like I was free to play for the longest time Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) until like right before WSOE which was like end of 2018 the most I had spent on Hearthstone was $15 and that's it wow um so like I took so long to hit legend because I was insistent on playing homebrew Mm -hmm. crappy warlock decks with like drain life and things like that I don't even remember like spell damage warlock that's what I wanted to play um but and when I started college, I had this one classmate who was actually legend in Hearthstone. And to me, that was like, damn, you're so good at the game. I yeah. thought it was this huge, huge achievement. No offense to the people that had it hit legend yet. Um, but I asked him for help and he told me, go just build a zoo deck and play that. So we built a zoo. He helped me reach some of the higher ranks and then I got to legend eventually. So after I hit that, it was like such a big achievement. I remember how giddy I was. Mm-hmm. And I miss those days. Now that you hit it, it was, like now it was that a you, simpler time. It was a simpler time. I know now <laughs> you just hit like rank one legend, and you're just like, oh gosh, it's such a chore, mm-hmm. right? I mean, I guess <laughs> rank one. That's um, so wild. It it's not really a chore. Like, it's a grind for sure. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I wouldn't be trying to hit rank one legend if I didn't still enjoy the game and enjoy competition, right? Because ladder doesn't really count towards anything yeah. except trying to get to the qualifiers right now. But I still want like to um, be able to prove that I can do the game well because it's not like hitting rank one is like extremely easy right now. It may not be as hard as it would be during a competitive season, 
but mm -hmm. it still took hours and hours. Like there's still streamers like Bloody Face, for example, he just tweeted he hit rank one after streaming for 16 hours mm -hmm. and you know, days before that. So it's still a respectable achievement. So I like, that's why I tried to get it. What do you think are um, the hardest or like the biggest, op maybe not big, biggest obstacles or principles that you had to learn to go from just hitting legend to, you know, I being rank one or to being used to competing for the top 100 spots on a ah. consistent basis? So the number one is focus because it's super easy and common for players to just like be laddering while multitasking. For me, I would be watching streams while playing or mm -hmm. maybe watching TV shows even. Mm -hmm. And right now I was doing a lot of Duolingo Chinese <laughs> while, while trying to hit legend, but that does not help your win rate at all. Like um, towards the higher ranks, I had to dedicate all of my focus onto the game. I have the deck tracker up. It helps a lot unless you have perfect memory and all of that. Yep. Um, and just try not to burn yourself out because I have this bad habit of when I hit a losing streak, I tilt, but it makes me want to win more just to break the losing streak, but yeah. I end up losing more, right? So you should be able to stop yourself when you know that you're playing badly because of the tilt. Just, you know, it'll still be there tomorrow. There's no more point to finishing and all, all of that. So you can go for it the next day. Do you have like right? a hard rule? And when you are at a rested, Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. You can. Um, I, I just think that uh, another thing I do is switching decks too often, but this works for some people. But for me, I generally perform better when I just stick on the one deck because I, well, you get more experience on it and you just get in that mindset better. But it's very tempting to switch decks after you lose a lot with one because, you know, you feel like you're getting bad matchups and all of that but i would recommend staying to one deck if you had and some amount of success with it even though at some point you hit a losing streak you're probably going to be successful. okay so um you brought this uh mid-range hunter list and um for those of you at home who cannot see the video or you're not watching this on youtube it's a two shimmer fly two spring paw two timber wolves one tracking one head hunter's hatchet Two scavenging hyenas, two scale hides, two animal companions, two deadly shots, two kill commands, two master's call, two unleash the hounds, two dire frenzies, two mark shots, one tundra rhino, two mark shot, one tundra yeah. rhino, two unleash the beast, and Zuljin. Yeah. I remember the bottom. So that um, you know what, I'm gonna I am making a big revel uh, revelation here that i haven't really done and like hunter and shaman are my least played ca classes i rarely ah. ever play hunter because in beta i had the most horrible experience with hunter unleash the hounds was so <laughs> ridiculous in beta oh, yeah. oh my god i hate it like hunter i i have like you know i have a, a picture of rexar i'm like right above my bed and every night like i punch it you know, but uh, no, I'm, just kidding. I'm kidding. But, uh, you know, Hunter, like, I just don't play it a lot. So you sent me the deck list a couple days ago. I saw it on your Twitter. And I was like, you know what? Before I get G on a stream, I better play the deck a bit, get the feel for it. You know, I'm a pretty good Her uh, Hearthstone player. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not too shabby. I'll, this, this is cool. We gotta go level with it. So I played it yesterday. And um, my, <laughs> I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to get five wins. I got like a little five win quest. Let me just play till I get five wins. So let me just tell you, I went like two and seven. Two wins, seven losses. I couldn't believe oh, it. No. I couldn't believe And this is not this is not like legend. Did this is you not hit rank like three. All Sean, all this is like rank nine, rank eight, you know what I mean? And I know it's my I'm playing the, the deck bad, so I do have a lot of questions that I want to ask you. Um, the first sure. off being, why did you choose this deck? And like what types of decks did you want to face and what didn't you want to face so uh people debate about this but i think hunter is favored mage which was like one of the most popular decks on top legend at the time mm -hmm. um it's a little bit less favored when they're running frostbolt and stuff but i just think that you know huffer and scavenging hyena are just things that mage cannot deal with easily and then 
your hero power is insanely good against mage yep. because they have one source of healing, Zilliax, and that's it. Um, so mage is the big one. Then control warrior, I think that hunter should be favored against that. People are saying it's not against a good control warrior player. And mm -hmm. by good, I mean if they get boom, mad genius on yeah, seven. seven. Yeah, seven. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, it can be a bit harder. So that's why you see people running like augmented Alec these days. But I personally don't really like the Alec. But I do think Hunter is favored in that matchup. Um, it's also uh, not too bad against like Zoo and Token Druid. It like it seems like it would be bad on paper, but Unleash the Hounds is just an insanely good card in those matchups. Um, it will struggle against Rogue though. Temple Rogue is definitely the hardest matchup. How about Bomb Warrior? Bomb Warrior is pretty easy or mm. pretty even? Ooh, I would say that's like not very. It's like very slightly favored i'd put it maybe 52 53 percent because mm -hmm. um you cannot deal with boom with six bombs on board it's just really yeah. difficult you need to have exactly unleash into like removal for boom itself um but that's a matchup where you can definitely win in fatigue uh oh, wow. if you do take the game that long just because zildjian is if you manage to survive till a good zildjian you should be fine in that matchup but it's tough like uh, at Vegas, I also played mid-range hunter, and my win rate against bomb warrior was not great. I went two and three, mm -hmm. so it, it's not a an amazing matchup for sure. And then there's a lot of aggro shaman, which I was losing to a lot at the beginning, but I think I figured out how to play the matchup to make it a lot better for the hunter. I don't know if it's actually favorable for hunter or um, maybe the aggro shamans weren't playing optimally, but towards the end of my legend run, my win rate was super high against aggro shaman. I see. I see. So, like, how do? What is the game plan with this deck? Like, what what are you trying to do? Like, what kind, are there like certain combos that you're trying to achieve and push forward? Like, are, are you always trying to be the aggressor? Are you playing for board? Like, well, the beauty of it being mid range is that you can for a faster game or a more control oriented game plan against rogue. Most of the time, you're playing control. You just want to remove their stuff. You want to dire frenzy your scale hides and survive until Zuljin locks them out of the game. Um, same with Agro Shaman. Against a uh, bomb warrior, you can play control or you can be aggressive. It depends on your opening hand and how their opening turns line up. Against control warrior, I think you're supposed to be the aggressor. And that's why people think the matchup's unfavored is because they try to outvalue them with their own Zuljin. Mm. But to me, it's more important that you get some type of pressure rolling in the earlier turns so that they can't use the resources efficiently and they can't just take too much damage. So um, getting the pressure game plan means that you go like one drop hyena, animal companion, frenzy that, and then like every turn you're dealing a little bit more damage. And by the time they get to Dr. Boom, um, either they can't survive your Zildjian or you can kill them before fatigue ever even comes into play. Um. So there are two cards. Against Mage, you're definitely the aggressor. But there's very fringe situations where you can play to a Zuljin out, but very fringe. So you, you think Cyclone Mage really is, that's that's in your favor, that matchup? I mean, you got the hero power. Okay, people will argue with me about this. APX says it's Mage favored, but I guess I'm biased. I think it's Hunter favored. Mm -hmm. um, not by a whole lot, but I just think that cards like Kill Command and your hero power and scavenging hyena like that those are just on paper things that mage will struggle to deal with because like i mean like what really feels bad is like sorcerer's apprentice double mirror and then oh, yeah. like and you know you need to mage. have you need to have exactly unleashed timberwolf to deal with that and mm -hmm. yeah i mean but you can make the same argument right if mage gets the nuts hand they're not gonna they're gonna beat anything. any class that's true. right that's true. so i'm talking about the average mage draw um, in which case your hunter should be okay. So there are two cards that, like, I know I question, like, when the right time to play them is. And mm -hmm. so I know people, other people probably have the same question. And th those are Master's Call and Dire Frenzy. Like, when is the right time mm -hmm. to play Master's Call? And what are the right targets for Dire Frenzy in, like, what matchup? You know, okay. I so I could write a whole essay on this. <laughs> um, Timing of Master's Call is just like, basically, if you can play Companion and you're trying to pressure them, you play Companion over Master's Call. But if 
you have no good pressure play that turn, it's generally better to go for a Master's Call just because it's one of the most powerful draw cards in Hearthstone right now. It might even be the most powerful um, outside of Stargazer. Hmm. Uh, but um, Timing of Frenzy, if you're trying to be the aggressor, and this is not always just based on the matchup. It's based on your evaluation of the matchup. I can tell you it's more common to be the aggressor against Mage, but there are situations where you might try to win off of Zildjian. Um, but you just frenzy any available target when you're trying to be the aggressor because you're just jamming another three damage to their face. But ideally, the one drops are good targets. Uh, Spring Paw and uh, Timberwolf against Mage are pretty good just because they're cheap. You can go on four mana, Master's Call, draw one of the four fours and play it on that same turn. And importantly, you can pair them with Tundra Rhino for a lot of burst damage. So the one drops are good against Mage. Against Bomb Warrior, Scale Height is your number one frenzy target. Um, number two is probably Tundra Rhino. And against Control Warrior, Tundra Rhino, most likely. A lot of people try to go for like the Timberwolf OTK, but I think that's like it's very rare when you end up going for that. And it actually works. Hmm. I, I just like frenzy aggressively. That's what I like to do. And against um Shaman and Rogue, you want to frenzy either Spring Paw or Scale Hide most often because mm -hmm. they can rush and rushing minions are great for controlling the board. Okay. Um, what are, what do you think are the two flexible, most flexible cards in this list? Like, and what would you take them out to shore up your ma your win rate versus another matchup? I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, Unleash the second copy of Unleash the Beast is probably not necessary. I was just facing a lot of control warriors. Good. Mm -hmm. And also the mirror, it's good in the mirror. Um, but you can remove that, add another headhunter's hatchet. You can remove, I think, a mark shot maybe. Although I really like a mark shot. Um, because you don't have cards in the four drop slot. So it's just good to spend your mana. The number one rule as midrange hunter is spend all your mana. Okay. <laughs> it seems like a dumb thing to say, but it's actually really important to take note of. Um, you can add more anti-aggro tech, like another hatchet. You can add rat trap versus rogue. It's also semi-decent against mage. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, you would rather develop a minion than play a rat trap on turn two. I've seen people removing scavenging hyena, but I think that's just wrong. I think the card's insane. Mm -hmm. um, even in the matchups where you think it would not be doing that well, like rogue, later on, sometimes you can find a turn to just double trade spring paws and play hyena, and it's just you know, relatively large, still better. And I just think that removing your only playable minion on turn two for two mana is bad for matchups like uh, Mage and Warrior because it helps so much. Mm. Um, what else can you cut? Mm, I've seen people removing a deadly shot, but I think that the card's just good. So much Mage right now. Yeah. And aside from Mage, you can also Deadly Shot to deal with stealth minions like Spirit of the Frog, Spirit of the Shark, Edwin. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, in terms of mulligans, uh, are there some cards that you always hold in the mulligan? Um, and are there also cards uh, Master's that, Call. Master's Call, you always hold that. Yeah. Um, th I've thought about throwing it against Mage, for example, if you're on the play and you have nothing else. Uh, because it's really important to go one drop, two drop, and hopefully companion in that matchup. But Master's Call is just so good on average that I don't think I'm ever tossing it in any matchup these days. Hmm. Um, on the coin, you never, ever, ever toss it. Huh? On the play, there's maybe a 5% chance you toss it. I don't know. I'm not sure if it's completely correct, but that's what I've been doing. Um, I keep Spring Paw against all the aggressive matchups. I keep Shimmer Fly, I think, basically every matchup too, because it's the best thing you can do on turn one. Yeah. And um, against Rogue, I like to keep Scale Hide. Uh, it's also decent against Shaman, just because the one three stat line with Rush is very convenient for dealing with their stuff. And uh, I keep Companion almost every matchup too. Do you ever uh, keep uh, a ridiculously slow card like Zoljin for a certain matchup? Or yeah. Yeah. You definitely keep it against Control Warrior. I also keep it against Bomb Warrior. It's not always worked out, but um, basically I only keep it against Warriors. Like, uh, You can keep it in the Hunter Mirror too, but on Ladder, there's a lot of Mech Hunter too, and mm -hmm. Zildjian is not great. So 
since I won't know what type of hunter it is, I throw Zul'jin when I see a hunter. So, that, you know, that's one deck that we didn't really talk about earlier, is Mech Hunter. Uh, do you feel yeah, yeah. that mid-range hunter... I, what is the matchup like versus those two decks? Who do you think is favored? I think whoever's on the play is favored. Really? I hate to, I hate to sip, oversimplify it, but like this is one matchup where you being on the coin is not that great. Because against Mech Hunter, if you just clear their board every turn, none of their stuff has charge. Mm -hmm. The deck's powerful at smorking because if one thing sticks, suddenly all your magnetics have charge, yeah. quote unquote. But if you get like a one drop into like hyena slash scale height slash headhunters hatchet, you can deal with their mecharoo, you can deal with their galvanizer, and then you just get bored from there. Mm -hmm. um, but if they're going first and they play mecharoo, and you, you don't want to go spring paw coin links into that, especially if you don't have a two drop, and then suddenly the magnetics can overrun you. Yeah. So I think the matchup's really close. Wow. That's good insight. You know, like I, I this is something I, I rarely think about is how big the difference in like win rate is on or off the coin. And I, but you know, I mean, yeah. I guess it is pretty significant now that I think about it because, like, even if you were able to deal with the mecharoo, like, you're always being reactive to the board every turn, right? Like, you have to keep it clear. So, I mean, you're always playing behind. And then they drop the oh, three two where they put the two bombs. Right? Like, well, sometimes you, if you have the weapon, that's a huge deal. And the other huge thing is scavenging hyena. It's really, really good in that matchup because they don't have single target removal until they can go like, I don't know, spider bomb. And that's not even guaranteed mm -hmm. single target removal or the poisonous guy. Um, but yeah, it, it's generally fine. And also their big power combo of the minimizer. The missile launcher. What's it called? missile launcher yeah. you can deal that with that with a single at least shot mm -hmm. so that is also a good thing for mid-range hunter i'm sure the coin can be useful as well if you just get catch it and if they miss their one drop you're that's true uh i might be biased though and the, the good thing is that they play two one drops, just two Mecharoo, and you play six one drops. You play double Spring Paw, double Shimmerfly, double Timberwolf. Even though Timberwolf doesn't feel good to play on turn one, it's perfectly fine against Mech Hunter turn one. So on the aggressive matchups, you keep Timberwolf in the opening hand? Mm, not necessarily. I mean, like I would much, I'd much rather have Spring Paw. I wouldn't keep Timberwolf, but if I'm given Timberwolf off the Mulligan and I'm on the play, I always play it turn sure, one in yeah. the aggressive matchup. All right, all right. Are there any um, like decisions that don't, that seem counterintuitive with the deck that people playing it for the first time might make a mistake doing? Like mm -hmm. counterintuitive. Like something that like I don't know. You'd be like, okay, yeah, I definitely this is turn five or whatever. I definitely want to play this, but in reality, um, it's like you I should never do this or something. There's a lot of, I guess. 100 players that their first instinct is always smart with this deck as long as you can play a minion just always play a minion but there are situations where it's better to draw with master's call or it's better to hold minions for example against warrior um in the early turns it's very important that you don't play into their dynamatics even if it means you don't develop an animal companion that turn it's fine mm -hmm. um because you don't want to give them their efficient well yeah. and then in the mid-range hunter mirror, I also like to hold on to my minions sometimes. I don't play a Tundra Rhino just straight up to threaten lethal because it's much better later on and it dies straight up to unleash the beast. Um, and sometimes it can be better because you play a lot of removal cards in my list. You play double deadly shot, you play double mark shot. So sometimes it's, it's better to take a step back and use your removal take the turn to respond to your opponent. And then when they run out of threats, that's when you go in with your threats. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So, hey, um, let's, I, before we get into an actual game, a uh, co-op game, um, just want to thank you again for jumping on the show and, you know, talking about your experiences as both a player and a caster and as a female. Um, no worries. Uh, is there anything you want to say to people at home, like where they can follow you or or follow your journey as a first um, player? Yeah, um, basically, I'm only on Twitter. I'm not really good with the 
whole social media thing. My friends have been telling me to get an Instagram for like years now. But yeah, just Twitter at GAD underscore. I have not been streaming lately, but I plan to try again within the within this year at some point. So twitch.tv slash Gia underscore HS. But don't hold your breath because my, my setup is not good right now for streaming. Um, what are you missing for your setup? Like that would take it to the next internet. level. It's a good oh, internet. Okay. It's, it's great. Yeah. I, I think I've been cutting out a lot during this podcast. Sorry. It's not too bad. It's not, I mean, it was a couple of times, but it's not like. Okay. We, we it's not unwatchable. Time. Oh, definitely. But a stream on this internet would be pretty unwatchable, I think. So, hmm. um, yeah. There's that. Awesome. Awesome. Mm. So, yeah, let's, uh, we're going to just jump into the game. If you guys are listening to the audio version of this podcast, thank you for tuning in. You got to meet Gia. Um, great caster, great player, rank one mid-range hunter, right? And that's what the deck we were talking about today. Oh. Um, yeah. We are Thank going you. to uh, play into um, a game on the YouTube channel. So if you're not following, make sure you follow on youtube.com slash HS, and you'll be able to catch uh, the visual version as we get into like one or two games, probably one game of uh, the co-op. Cool. So. Thank you so much for joining. And we're just going to jump into it. I don't know, G. I I don't know if I have you on my friends list. Uh, I'm not sure you do. I'm opening up Hearthstone right now. Yeah, let me let me send you my thingy here. Sure. How do I do this? Uh, it's taking a while to let me log in. Hey, we didn't get to talk about Filipino food. Oh, my gosh. You know what? Let's talk about that a little <laughs> bit. That's my favorite yeah, let's subject. That. That's my favorite subject. So what? Okay. All right. All right. Um, what is your favorite Wait, first of all, is Filipino food your favorite cuisine? Okay, this is going to sound like I'm a traitor, but I love Japanese food oh the most. God. But it's not that I don't like Filipino food. I love Filipino food. Okay, it's just okay. like, I love a whole lot of food. What is your favorite? <laughs> Mostly Asian. What are your top three Filipino dishes that you like okay. to eat? Uh, sisig, number one. Wow. Pork sisig, <laughs> uh, right? Yes. Okay, okay. It is superior. Uh... What's number two? Okay, as of college, um, there's this 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 area of like little. What's karinderia in English? <laughs> what, um, what is it? Uh, what is it in Filipino? Karinderia. I don't know. Uh, at, at UP, there's just an area where there's a lot of small vendors and small restaurants, uh -huh. uh, where they make a lot of comfort food and street food. Mm -hmm. And I had a tradition with some of my classmates that we would go there after exams and eat bulalo. Oh <laughs> my goodness. Okay, actually my favorite foods are like some old Filipino tito. <laughs> Sisig and bulalo. Um, but the third one is sinigang, which is most anyone Dude. would like that, I think. Dude. I wish I could fit kare kare up in the top oh three, but God. I just couldn't. Oh I couldn't my. displace bulalo. <laughs> That's my, uh, kare kare is my wife's favorite. But, um... Ah. Mine, I like uh, Bulalo. That's my first. And then I got <gasps> Nilaga and Sinigang. They're both pretty close. Nilaga and yes. Sinigang. So I, I like both of those. And then my third is um, Lechen Kowale, of course. You know what I mean? Like, uh, that's, mm -hmm. I just got to do it the right. The party so. food. Yeah, you know. You know. Um, I'm sorry. Hearthstone's not letting me log in for some reason. I'm stuck in the, on the, the door screen oh, oh my God. without it's the that... logo. Wow, is that internet? Uh, I can spectate you on Discord if you like share. Oh, screen. okay, okay. Let me do that. Let me see. Uh, how do I do that? Turn on screen share. Okay, we do that. Um, application window. Okay, okay. There. Let me know if you can hey, see. Hey, there you go. All right, cool. So those of you watching home, we're gonna get okay. right into it. I, I Google translated Kinderi. It's cafe. That's not true. Oh, okay. Like, Google Translate says Karinderia in English is cafe. That's not even cool. But it's like a food, like a street market, right? Like a street. Like... Uh, it's quite a market. Mm. It's more like a cafeteria, but not in a school. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. How do I say No, I get it. I get it. It's like kind of outside. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? Those are always the okay. most rich. Let's it up. The, those are always the most rich uh, foods to eat in the Philippines. Like where you, where you take a risk and you're just out there eating on the street. Because I've had some really good food <laughs> on the street, 
But then I've also had some really, really bad experiences eating food on the street. So, but, um, man, that's cool, man. That's my favorite, yeah, too. Yeah, Hula you gotta Lola. have a relatively strong stomach for it. Gosh, where is that man? You know, the last the last trip I took to the Philippines, I was, uh, you know, we did the med- medical check at um, uh, St. Luke's. But we also Valeria went to this place. Uh, it's it's outside of Manila. It's known Remain for its Bulalo. Um, gosh, what is the name of this place? I don't know when it like overlooks a mountain. Hold on a sec, I'm disconnecting a bit. Oh. So I'm thinking we don't, what is this? What are we challenging here? Mage, we're gonna get rid of this deadly shot and dire yeah. frenzy. Um, I'll just keep the shimmer fly. Yeah. So a lot of people actually like to be shot against mage, but. That... Uh... Okay, that's a decent hand. Um, I think you shouldn't keep deadly shot against mage because they're hardly ever gonna play a lone giant. Oh, shoot. They're probably going to wait until they can go giant calling. And I call to keep deadly shot, I mean. But yeah, we always do. Now. Okay, hold on. Oops. I mean, I'm fixing my... I forgot to switch this. Okay, there. There we go. Now we got the screen working. Okay, no worries. So I, I want to yeah, be the aggressor here, right? Deadly shot against Mage far too much, I think. Yeah, I don't... I, 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 can't, I can't really see keeping that... I, it's just there's too many like yeah, weird situations where um, you know the mage can just like flood the board with like the the zero two things right. or like this is crazy tempo turns right they're, so yeah the thing is they're hardly gonna play a lone giant so I would prefer to just look for more aggressive stuff especially when you're on the play yeah so let's just play a scale hide here um, technically it's less damage than a hero power but if it gets attacked twice it's as much damage as a hero power. Plus, we're probably gonna play Timberwolf next turn. So, board development is always um, king. Okay. So, but in like a warrior matchup or something, I would opt to not play the scale hide, or do you think that's always probably the right play on an empty board? Yeah. Um, I would probably not play it, you're right, uh, against warrior because um, you, if you don't know whether it's bomb, you will need it to heal up. But if you know it's control, you can just play scale hide to get the board. What I like to do against warrior is play scale hide on the turn they go dynamatic, so that if you have, say, a Misha with your scale hide, you have seven health on board that survives dynamatic. Okay. So would you, would you say Timberwolf hero power is the play here? Or, I mean, it uses um, the mana the I best. I want to play but... a scale hide and Timberwolf. <laughs> okay. Like, you don't need the healing against mage. You just want to smork. And the hero power is inferior to board development. See, okay. the scale height, the first one you played already dealt two damage, so it's already doing more than your hero power. Like, in terms of, like, it's on board and it dealt the damage. So, uh, it looked like the ping was a bit annoying for him. Like, it, it sucks that we lost our Timberwolf, but he had to do that on his three mana turn. Against yeah. Mage, that means you're denying Arcane Intellect, it means yep. you're denying Banana Buffoon, and that's pretty good. Cool. So here, I want to start with Flare hmm. because I want to look for something better to do next turn, but we're probably just going to play the Hatchet after the Flare. Okay. Okay. So we, we don't want to save it for the possibility that he might Ooh, draw into something. Hyena. Okay. And hopefully they don't uh, have like a Frostbolt, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, um, they don't play Secrets naturally in the deck they get generated sometimes but i think it's just more important to make sure we have something powerful to do every turn hyena is one of the best cards okay okay now we're a little bit sad we don't have deadly shot so yeah let's start with the mark shot on the giant you can get wing blast that's pretty good here oh that sucks um you're gonna have to take the freezing trap i think and as much as this sucks, we have to double trade into the giant. Okay. Like, yeah, we give up a scale hide and a hyena. So, with the way this matchup is going, we didn't get a very aggressive hand. We didn't draw Animal Companion. So, I think we're gonna just try and remove his stuff and try to win off of Zoltan. This is one of those cringe situations I was talking about. Okay. All right. 
so I'm probably thinking companion and hatchet, but I, the Unleash the Beast is interesting also because one, it uses all our mana, that's always mm -hmm. good, and it still leaves a 5-2 on board. Hmm. Yeah. So I actually think I'm leaning towards the Unleash the Beast here. It's because we're trying to win off Soldier right? so the sooner you can get those in the pool, the better. Yeah, and two, I mean, two health is not easy for Mage to kind of get rid of, right? At least not Cyclone yeah, Mage. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, they have to double Ray of Frost, or if they're running Frostbolt, sure. Okay. The future is ours. Oh, he plays Luna here? <laughs> That's, like, really good for us. Um... So... I'm tempted to just unleash the beast into the Luna and then go face with the 5-2. Like, you leave a buffoon on board, but uh, it's a little bit scary to conjure his calling. So the other line of play we could do is, like, kill command the yeah. Luna, ha hatchet, and freezing trap. Mm -hmm. um, I like, I mean, I, that, that's, that uses the mana better. I'm not a big fan, better. though. I w yeah, it does, but I kind of want a 5-3 on board. Let's do it. Because if he goes conj calling on this buffoon, that means that we still have a 5-2 and a 5-3, right? He's not going to trade it in. Mm -hmm. I'm not 100% on the play, though. Oh, he had Cadguard. That's... Oh. So he's going CJ? Okay, we kind of need Unleash the Hounds now. Whoops. Hmm. <laughs> Why did he... <laughs> Sorry, rank eight's of something else. I, it's crazy. I... Oh, maybe, and we yeah. could still lose. I mean, it doesn't look like we're winning from here because it's just Cyclone Mage being dumb, mm -hmm. as usual. But, um... Okay, let's start with Companion and see what we get. We might have to KC the, the Khadgar, unfortunately. Yeah, I think we're gonna have to. Yeah, we're gonna KC the Khadgar. And I want to play Hyena over Hatchet, actually, because you get it on board. The Hatchet will still kill something later. I feel like the images aren't really doing much for him, right? It's kind of taking up board space. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. He doesn't have... He only has one more banana to buff onto the images, so I'd rather get the Hyena on board now. Okay. Ooh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> well, that created happens. By, created by, created by. I love Cyclone Mage, man. Honestly, like this deck is so. Uh, I like the wild version. I don't yeah, really Mage care too much the about this one. Strongest deck by far. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. But we might be able to win off of it. Okay, uh, let's take this 50-50. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Are you feeling lucky? Yeah, of course. I'm, we're doing it. Uh, if okay, with heart, heart of the cards, heart of the cards, heart of the cards. Let's go! Oh! Nice. Okay. We, go. we can play the freezing just because he doesn't have a banana anymore. So, I mean. So, we're just going to Zuljin for pressure okay. next turn. It's pretty good because we have a deadly shot in the pool. We have two Unleash the Beast, and he'll know what the freezing trap is, but whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And we'll also get a flare that's. Decent-ish. Oh. Okay, wait, let me I kind of want to delay the Zildjian now. Wait, yeah, me too. Wait, let's see. I kind of want to delay it too. I think we just kill this off and then kill the shield. Yeah, I kind of want to do that trap, too. Right? I, I like that. We can get a better Zildjian. Yeah. Kill it off and then hit the whole two. The, the, the thing that sucks is we don't have Master's Call in the pool. That mm. really, really sucks. That means we're only drawing one card off the Zildjian from Flare. Mm. Um, but this will give us insane board presence with the Frenzy, unless we go Frenzy first, which is really unlucky. But because we played three minion generating spells, we played two Unleash the Beast and Animal Companion. So it's unlikely that the Frenzy with... Okay, this freezing is pretty good here. We get to replay the freezing as well. Like, not super relevant, but not a bad thing. Oh yeah, definitely not. 
See, the only thing that really sucks to me right here yeah, is if, is... like, there's a giant. Well, I guess so. The pen is my with the sword. Okay. So the order on this is I want no, I want to hit the tutu with your hatchet first. Hit the tutu with your hatchet oh, okay. because so you we played a deadly shot. shot. Okay. Yeah. And then I want to go face with the 8-4 first because we played a kill command. So the 8-4 the can die to the kill command. It's unlikely, but I would rather guarantee the 8 damage. Man, you know what? That always happens of, to me. It freaking yeah. happened to me the, like three the only times benefit of The only benefit of not attacking first is... Um, if we frenzy the 8-4, which is unlikely, and if we get Leok off of Animal Companion. So the most we miss is 4 damage, as opposed to possibly missing 8 damage if we didn't attack first. So mm. I think this is correct. Oh, was the enter in button green? Yeah, it was. Or was it? It was green. Okay, because like, sometimes you get hopper, right? No. Oh, we also played Mark Shot, so that could have killed the 8-4 as well. No. At least it both went on the same target. Oh. Man, Dire Frenzy. Seems good. Seems pretty good. <laughs> Frenzy's the nuts. We didn't even have Master's Call this game. That's insane. That was pretty wild. This game's going way better than the games I played get, yesterday, so. Yeah. You can still get a little bit screwed by, like, Giant double calling and he gets three taunts. But the good thing is he played Katkar oh, already, so he can't make a full board and all that. Mm, that was interesting. Yay. Alright, easy, easy. You know what? That was so quick. Can we do one more? Do you mind if we do one more? Oh, no, I don't mind at all. Sure. I love Hunter. <laughs> you love Hunter? Love this is, you know, man, I feel dirty playing Hunter. I just, gosh, man. Look at how many what? wins. 646. What do I got for <laughs> other classes? Like, okay, I guess I don't really have that many wins. It's just but. not that much less. It's like a hundred less than Warlock. It's not too bad. Nah, like, to be honest, Hunter was my last golden class as well. Really? Like, what is what is your favorite class? Favorite. Warlock. It used to be Shaman. Oh. Uh, okay. At first it was Warlock, and then when I first hit rank one Legend, it was with Shaman, so I like Shaman. But right now, uh, I love Hunter. <laughs> so basically, whatever I win with the most is my favorite. Class. That's a that's a good minute. Okay, so he's prob it's probably Zoo. So I want to keep Unleash and Timber because. Usually the the unleash on its own is not enough to deal with their minions. They have two or three health, mm -hmm. so unleash timber is pretty good. Okay. Yeah, and you're going second, so at least you can draw other stuff. Let's get a hatchet. We got one hatchet in here. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah, we were just passing, right? Or okay. do you feel like this is a matchup um, where you would just throw one on a board? Uh, we're passing here because we're on coin. We don't want to give him a free target. We're okay. probably just going to play Hyena next turn and then just wait to go Timber on me. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. So, I mean, if we play Timber here, he can still... Oh, yeah, no, I guess that's... Uh... Um, I, I would like to just play a Hyena. Who to shoot? Because either he trades the Flame Imp, he won't do that. Yeah. But, or he puts damage into the Void Walkers, which we really like because we're going to go Timber as each. Okay. <laughs> Sucks that... The, the hatchet which, like if we drew that right. earlier it yeah. now. like if we drew that turn one I would have considered playing Hayu in that turn one okay oh ho, ho, ho. it's alright what do we got we're still good yeah we're fine the light protects me Okay, you want to do the thing now? Um, if we do the thing now, it's one, two, three, four, yeah. five. I think we're we're taking too much damage. If we, uh, we can kill everything but the Argent Squire, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. This is a bit awkward because our 
turn four sucks, but I don't think we can wait another turn because if he has Grim Rally, yeah. Rally this gets way too awkward for us. Problems just on my end. The video is cutting out for me a little bit. Mm. Okay, this is gonna sound super slow, but I want to march on <laughs> because we're only removing one minion this turn anyway. So I want to yeah. march. We're marching the squire, right? I mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, this twin spell, right? I mean. Uh, oh, did we lose you? I don't know, let me see. Man, it's lagging so much for me. Oh, no, I can hear you, but we're taking Twin Spell, right? Uh, Rapid Fire. Or, I'm sorry, uh, the Rapid Fire, yeah. Oh no, I freaking hate this card. Uh, hmm. Ooh, carpets. Mm, annoying. Carpet is super annoying. Uh, so I want to put damage into the carpet so we can unleash the beast it later, but we might just rhino. Oh, it's a little. I like Rhino. I. Yeah. What if we um, Timberwolf Hatchet double wrap into the um, into the Macaroos? Hmm. Hmm. I think I like that better. So we can clear one and a half Macaroos, right? So okay. So one, 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 six. For the carpet, you don't. But want to play big things on the board because he can trade up and mm. this way he's trading into a Timberwolf anyway. Not, not getting much value and at least next turn because if there's no taunt we can clear the carpet 100% with Unleash the Beast and the weapon. Yeah. Good point, good point. Maybe he trades the A yeah. Oh my god, he's so lucky. Wow. <laughs> I know. Uh, what do we got here? For, uh, oh wow. Okay. Uh, okay, so, I feel like it's unlucky, unlikely for him to have another one drop here because he played two Makaru or two flame, one crystallizer already. Mm hmm. So I am tempted to clear two minions in the carpet. Um, I think that's the play. But if it's really hard. So I think we, we're behind, so we need to take a risk. I would go unleash the beast into the timber wolf and then use our hmm. hatchet to take down the flame myth. OK. You wouldn't go hatchet into the timber wolf and Ah, uh, no, I guess you, uh, you want that. No, no, I, I put the 5-5 five, five in the Timberwolf and take more damage. We need the board. Okay. Yeah. I mean, because this is probably like Just a... Just pray he doesn't have any more... Like a sea giant or something. Because he drew... Yeah, he drew off of that, so... He should be drawing more expensive stuff by now. I mean, he's holding something, so... Like, he's had this since turn five, so. Might be you, right? We could just die, though. I wonder. Gia, we are not dying, girl. We're not going to die right now. All right. <laughs> the heart of the cards, okay? We're. Maybe I was going too far to say that Sue was favorable, but. 
I forgot that magic carpet was a card. It's a very difficult card to deal with, in fact. And now he's got two of them. <laughs> it's okay. We, we got this. We're good. Oh, crap. <laughs> nah, we're good. We're good. We can just clear these out. Wait, he trades? Oh, wow. <gasps> Okay, can I get? How can I? Uh, God, uh, we can't take a hundred percent here, can we? I want to track. Wait, what? What? What can we get off of tracking? If there's a way to clear the two-two or the one-one, it's really. We can get unleashed. And we have three mana left, so. Spring paw is really good here. Yeah, I, I would track for spring paw. We give up Zul'jin, but I think we have to take it. Do you really like the Spring? Because we're not okay. surviving. Yeah, the Spring Paw is too good here. Because now you can go Spring Paw with the Hyena into the cart. Um. Yeah. Do an shot. We're not being. <laughs> okay, so what sucks is we trapped over the other scale height. I mean, one scale height. Yeah. Healing is gonna be tough. What kills us? Leroy and like. Oh, we're good. We're in it. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't have Zoljin. The lucky is. Yeah. The lucky is like. Not the greatest in Warlock. It's really good in Rogue. Oh. Oh, that can give us a ton. Oh, oh my god, this Lucker! <laughs> okay, at least we have a ton. Yeah, this is... Not that horrible, right? So, scale hide and uh, Unleash, right? So, we're good. Oh, we got scale hide. Nice. Um, unleash and scale hide. Really good here. So, kill the one tree and then... Uh, whichever lackey you prefer, they shouldn't run balance. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to kill that one too. It annoyed me more. It got yeah. rid of our, our hyena. <laughs> I hope they yeah. I hope they put out more Sword, lackey support. I I want to see more lackey stuff we for the next. We have top decks for lethal. Actually. Do we? Do we? Five, six. Is that twelve? Can we kill him next turn? We have so many top decks for lethal. Command, um, any animal companion. Actually, even a one, because we have six on board, three in hand, and two from the hero power. So that's uh, eleven. Yeah, He's on twelve right now. <laughs> so many impossible. We barely attacked his face. That's from him. To yeah, that's crazy. And then, yeah, how did he get so low? I didn't. It's a lot of life taps. Ooh. Oh, I think if we didn't... don't get lethal, this is a bit scary. But we're so likely to get lethal. Here. Yes, that's lethal. All the companions are lethal here. <laughs> nice. Wait, is this okay? Yeah, we're good, right? Easy. Dang. You know what? I gotta stop. Oh, I have. You turn into. <laughs> Hello? Sorry. I, I have to stop uh, playing Hearthstone while playing Underlords at the same time. That's my problem. <laughs> like, I'm playing two games at the same time, yeah. and I'm like, oh, man, I got to <laughs> shuffle my guys in Underlords. Like, But, yeah, no, that was awesome. That was pretty fun. Gia, thank you so much uh, for showing me the ropes of some of this mid-range Hunter play. I'm definitely going to play that deck a little more often. You know, who knows? Maybe I won't be such yeah. a hater, such a Hunter hater. <laughs> but, um, you know. I, I would. I consider that a victory. <laughs> so I, you know, I thank you so much for for joining me on the stream. Next time I go to the Philippines, I'm definitely gonna check you out. Treat you to some hula low at Chrysostomos or something. Yes. And then, um, yeah, definitely. It's, I had a good time. It was awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for having me. Kind of had a great time too. No problem. Um, you know, those of you are watching home, make sure you follow Gia on Twitter uh, at Gia D underscore. Right, and then. Yeah. Yeah, you know, check her out on uh, the different um, tournaments that hopefully she gets to uh, 
to commentate and cast on in the future. And, uh, yeah, I'll yeah. be casting uh, the School Master Store August 16th to 18th on twitch.tv slash Great, great. For those of you at home, thank you so much. We'll see you next week.